Hello everyone, welcome back to Pilot Time Reads. My name is Red and today we are back with another episode of reading the Communist Manifesto. Now today I am going to finish the book. Uh, whilst there is still two chapters left, they are very short. They're even shorter than the one I read in the last episode. So I have decided to read uh, both chapter three and chapter four in one episode. Um, I, this wasn't planned when I first started the series, but now I realize how small it's only like what yeah, it's 20 pages, uh, these last two chapters. So I think that it's only logical that I read them in one go. I think it's pretty weird to, um, essentially release a, like, you know, record a whole video or record two videos. I mean, uh, where I read them separately. So I've decided to just condense them into one episode. Um, however, um, I am still going to make a, wait, so this is the fourth episode then. So I'm still going to make a fifth episode where I am simply going to talk about uh, my thoughts uh, around it. Um, although I'm not sure when that's going to come out or if I might still reread the, the manifesto just, you know, to really be able to sink in or if I'm going to do some extra research on it, I'm probably going to do that. So uh, yeah, keep tuned to that. So yeah, I, I am going to release a fifth or we Paul time are going to release a fifth episode um, kind of just, I'm, I'm just going to be sharing my opinions on it essentially and trying to just del do a bit of a, um, a deep dive into the manifesto and, uh, that's probably going to be the shortest episode. I'm not going to be, you know, recording it for so long, um, for that long when it comes to that episode. Um, but yeah, uh, and then after that, we are going to, of course, uh, move on to the next book, which is going to be Another Now, uh, which I'm pretty excited about, uh, not only because I'm curious to read it, uh, and not also because I also want to, of course, read it on here because I think it's going to be an interesting story, but also because I'm curious to read it for my own personal writing stuff. I'm curious to kind of read it and see how it's going to inspire me uh, for my writing. So I'm excited about that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, before I do start reading, don't of, of course, don't forget to support us over on Patreon if you do enjoy the content we make. Uh, if you do so, you can also join our public Discord server. And if you do both, of course, you can um, get access to special um, stuff like submitting questions for our podcast, which you should also check out. Um, and of course, you should also check out our socials where we will keep you updated on, you know, certain stuff going on, for example, if there's an emergency or if we have to change some sort of content uh, scheduling thing because something happened, you know, you never know. We also, we never know. So make sure to follow us so that you are always um, uh, on top of everything going on with Paula time. And um, yeah, that's it. So let's actually start reading. So chapter three is called Socialist and Communist Literature. Um, and I'm guessing by this name that it's going to talk about different literature. <laughs> uh, I'm curious to see what this is about because I had no idea this was, I mean, I didn't really know anything about the Communist Manifesto going in. So it's, you know, um, fair that I don't really know. I didn't really know what, what that this was going to be part of it. So it starts off with one reactionary socialism, a feudal socialism. So let's start reading it. Owing to their historical position, it became the vocation of the aristocracies of France and England to write pamphlets against modern bourgeois society. In the French Revolution of July 1830 and in the English Reform agitation, these aristocracies again succumbed to the hateful upstart. Then, thenceforth, fancy wording, a, a serious political contest was altogether out of the question. A liter, 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 whoa literary battle alone remained possible but even in the domain of literature the old cries of the restoration period not the english restoration 16, uh, 1660 to 1689 but the french restoration of 1814 to 83 um had become impossible in order to arouse sympathy the aristocracy were obliged to lose sight apparently of their own interest and to formulate their indictment against the bourgeoisie in the interest of the exploited working class alone. Thus the aristocracy took their revenge by singing lampoons on their new master and whispering in, the, in his ears sinners prophecies of coming catastrophe. 
in this way arose feudal socialism a health a health whoa not a half a not a health a half lamentation half lampoon half echo of the past half half i'm having such trouble reading this word half menace of the future at times by its bitter witty and incisive incisive um incisive sorry criticism striking the bourgeoisie to very hard for to the very hard score but always ludicrous in its effect through total incapacity to comprehend the march of modern history the aristocracy in order to rally the people to them waved the proletarians on back in front for a banner but the people so often as it joined them saw on their hind hindquarters the old feudal costs of arms and deserted with loud and irreverent laughter one section of the french legitimists legitimists and young england exhibited this spectacle in pointing out their mode of exploitation was different to that of the bourgeoisie and the feudalists forgot that they exploited under circumstances and conditions that were quite different and that are now antiquated in showing that under their rule the proletariat never existed they forget that the modern bourgeoisie is the necessary offspring of their own form of society for the rest so little do they conceal the reactionary character of their criticism that their chief accusations against the bourgeoisie amount to this that under the bourgeois regime, <clears throat> regime a class is being developed which is destined to cut up the root and branch the old order of society what they upbraid the bourgeoisie with is not so much that it, it creates a proletariat as that it creates a revolutionary proletariat in political practice therefore they join in all coercive measures against the working class and in ordinary life despite their high pollutin phrases they stoop to pick up the golden apple dropped from the tree of industry and to barter truth love and honor for traffic in wood beetroot sugar and potato strips this applies chiefly to germany where the landed aristocracy and square archie not so what that is have large portions of their states cultivated for their own mount of stewards and are moreover extensive beetroot sugar manufacturers and distilleries of potato strips the healthier british aristocracy are as yet rather above that but they too know how to make up for declining rents of lending their name to floaters of more or less shady joint stock companies okay as the parson has ever gone hand in hand with the landlord so has clerical clerical socialism with feudal socialism nothing is easier than to give christian ascent ascentism a socialist stench as not christianity the claim against private property against marriage against the state has it not preached in the place of these charity and poverty celibacy and mortification of the flesh monastic life and mother church christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest concentrates the heart burning of the aristocrat now we're getting into a, another section of this chapter which is petty bourgeois socialism the feudal aristocracy has not the only class that was ruined by the bourgeoisie not the only class whose conditions of existence pinned and preached in the atmosphere of modern bourgeois society the medieval burgesses burgesses i'm not sure how to read that i know what it means i just don't know how to read it <laughs> and the small peasant proprietors were the precursors of the modern bourgeoisie in those countries which are but little developed industrially and commercially these two classes still vegetate side by side with the rising bourgeoisie in countries where modern civilization has become fully developed a new class of petty bourgeois has been formed fluctuating between proletariat and bourgeoisie and ever renewing itself as a supplementary part of bourgeois society the individual members of this class however are being 
constantly hurtled down into the proletariat by the action of competition. And as a modern industry develops, they even see the, mo the moment approaching when they will completely disappear as an independent section of modern society to be replaced in manufacturers, agriculture and commerce by overlookers, bailiffs and shopmen. In countries like France, where the peasant constitute, peasants constitute far more than half of the population, it has natural. It was natural that writers who sided with the proletariat against the bourgeoisie would use in their criticism of the bourgeois regime the standard of the peasant and petty bourgeois. And from the standpoint of these inter intermediate, intermediate sorry classes, should take up the cudgels uh, for the working class. Thus arose petty bourgeois socialism. Sismondi was the head of the school, not only in France, but also in England. This school of socialism dissected with great acuteness and contradictions in the conditions of modern production. It laid bare hip hypocritical apologies of econom economists, economists, sorry. It approved incontrovertibly the disastrous effects of machinery and division of labor, the concentration of capital and land in a few hands, overproduction and crisis. It pointed out the inevitable, inevitable ruin of the, <clears throat> the petty bourgeois and the peasant, the misery of the proletariat, the anarchy in production and crying in inequalities in the distribution of wealth, the industrial war of extermination between nations, the dissolution of old moral bonds of the old family relations of the old nationalities. In its positive aims, however, this form of socialism aspires either to restoring the old means of production and of exchange and with the old pro Pro, sorry, the old property relations and the old society or to cramping the modern means of production and of exchange with the framework of the old property relations that have been and were bound to be exploited by those means. <clears throat> In either case, it is both reactionary and utopian. It last, in its last words are corporate guilds for manufacture Pro patriarchal relations in agriculture. Ultimately, when stubborn historical facts and ha had dis dispersed all intoxicating effects of self-deception, this form of socialism ended in a miserable fit of the blues. <clears throat> okay, now we have another section, which is German or true socialism. The socialist and communist literature of France, a literature that originated under the pressure of bourgeoisie in power and that has the expression of the struggle against power, was introduced into Germany at the time when the bourgeoisie in that country had just begun its contest with feudal absolutism. German philosophers would be philosophers and Bo X S what? That's, that's a French word, okay? Keep that in mind. Uh, and Bo Esprits. Uh, I know what that is. I definitely know what that is. Uh, eagerly seized on this literature, only forgetting that when these writing immigrant immig right? when, when these writings immigrated from France into Germany, French social conditions had not immigrated along with it. In contact with the German social conditions, this French literature lost its immediate practical significance and assumed a purely literary aspect. Thus, to the German philosopher of the 18th century, the demands of the first French Revolution were nothing more than the demands of practical reason in general, and the utterance of the will of the revolutionary French bourgeoisie signified in their eyes the law of pure will, of will as it was bound to be, or, uh, sorry, to be of true human will generally. The work of the German literary consisted solely in bringing the French ideas into harmony with their ancient philosoph philosophical conscience, or rather in annexing, annexing the French ideas without deserting their own philosophic point of view. This annexation took place in the same way in which a foreign language is appropriated, namely by translation. 
It is well known how the monks wrote silly lives of Catholic saints over the manuscript on which the classical works of ancient heathendom had been written. The German literati reversed this process with the profane French literature. They wrote their philosophical nonsense beneath the French original. For instance, beneath the French criticism of the economic functions of money, they wrote alienation of humanity. And beneath the French criticism of the bourgeois state, they wrote the thronement of the category of the general, and so forth. The introduction of these philosophical phrases at the back of French historical criticism, they dubbed philosophical of actions, true socialism, German science of socialism, philosophical foundation of socialism, and so on. The French socialist and communist literature was thus completely emasculated. And since it ceased in the hands of the German to express the struggle of one class with the other, he felt conscious of having overcome French one-sidedness and representing not true requirements, but the requirements of truth, not the interest of proletariat, but the interest of human nature, of man in general, who belongs to no class, has no reality, who exists only in the misty realms of philosophical fantasy. This German socialism, which took its schoolboy task too seriously and sodomly and... Oh, I skipped the page. Shit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to read that again. <laughs> this German socialism, which took its schoolboy task so seriously and sodomly and extolled its poor stock in trade in such mountback fashion, meanwhile gradually lost its pedantic innocence. The fight of the German, and especially of the Persian bourgeoisie against feudal aristocracy and absolute monarchy, in other words, the liberal movement, became more earnest. By this, the long-wished-for opportunity was offered to true socialism of confronting the political movement with the social dem socialist demand of hurling the traditional anthemus against liberalism, against representative government, against bourgeois competition, bourgeois freedom of the press, bourgeois legislation, bourgeois liberty and equality, and of preaching to the masses that they had nothing to gain and nothing to lose, or uh, sorry, and everything to lose by this bourgeois movement. German socialism forgot in the nick of time that the French criticism whose silly echo it was, presupposed the existence of modern bourgeois society, with its corresponding economic conditions of existence, and the political constitution adapted thereto the very thing, things whose attainment was the object of the pending struggle in Germany. To the absolute governments, with their following of parsons, professors, countries, squires and officials, it served as a welcome scarecrow against the threatening bourgeoisie. It was a sweet finish after the bitter pills of flogging and bullets with which the same governments just at the time those the German working class risings. With its true socialism, thus served the governments as weapons for fighting the German bourgeoisie. It, at the same time, directly represented a reactionary interest, the interest of the German Philistines. In Germany, the petty bourgeois class, a relic of the 16th century, and since then constantly cropped up against under various forms, is the real social basis of the existing states of things. Existing states of things, sorry. To... Preserve this class is to preserve the existing state of things in Germany. The industrial and political supremacy of the bourgeoisie threatens it with certain destruction. On the one hand, from the con con concentration of capital. On the other, from the rise of rev revolutionary proletariat. True socialism appeared to kill those two birds with one stone. It spread like an epidemic. The robe of speculative cobwebs, embroidered with flowers of rhetoric, steeped in the dew of sickly sediment, this transcendental robe in which German socialists wrap their sorry eternal truths 
all skin and bone, serve to wonderfully increase the sale of their goods amongst such a public. And on its part, German socialism recognized more and more its own calling as the bombastic representative of the petty bourgeois Palestine. It proclaimed the German nation to be the model nation and the German petty Palestine to be the typical man. To every villainous means of this model man, it gave a hidden, higher socialistic interpretation of the exact contrary of its real character. It went to the extreme lengths of directly opposing the brutally destructive tendency of communism and of proclaiming its supreme, supreme and impartial co contempt of all class struggles. With very few exceptions, all the so-called socialist and communist publications that now, 1847, circulate in Germany belong to the domain of this foul and enervating literature. Now we have conservative or bourgeois socialism. This is still in chapter three. A part of the bourgeoisie is desirous of redressing social grievances in order to secure the continued existence of bourgeois society. To this section belong economists, philanthropists, humanitarians, improvers of the conditions of the working class, organizers of charity, members of societies for the prevention of cruelty of animals, temperance fanatics, whole and corner for reformers of every imaginable kind. This form of socialism has moreover been worked out in complete systems. We may cite Pro Proud Hounds, I don't know who that is, uh, Philosophy de la Miserie as an example of this form. The socialistic bourgeois want all the advantages of modern social conditions without the struggles and dangers necessarily resulting therefrom. They desire the existing state of society minus it, its revolutionary and disintegrating elements. They wish for a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. The bourgeoisie naturally conceives the world in which it, it is supreme to be the best. And the bourgeois socialism develops this comfortable conception into various more or less complete systems. Requiring the proletariat to carry out such a system and thereby to march straight straightway into the social new Jerusalem, it but requires in reality that the proletariat should remain within the bounds of existing society, but should cast away all its hateful ideas concerning the bourgeoisie. A second and more practical but less sympathetic form of this socialism sought to deprecate every revolutionary movement in the eyes of the working class by showing that no mere political reform, but only a change in the material conditions of existence in economical relations could be of any advantage to them. By changes in the material conditions of existence, this form of socialism, however, by no means understands abolition of bourgeois relations of productions, an abolition that can be affected only by a revolution, but administration reforms based on the continued existence of these relations, reforms, therefore, that are that in no respect affect the relations between capital and labor, but at the best lessen the cost and simplify the administrative work of bourgeois government. Bourgeois socialism attains adequate expression when and only when it becomes a mere figure of speech, free trade for the benefit of the working class, productive duties for the benefit of the working class, prison reform for the benefit of the working class. This is the last word and only seriously meant words, the word of bourgeois socialism. It is summed up in the phrase, the bourgeois is a bourgeois for the benefit of the working class. Okay, now we go on to the third part of this, of this chapter, which is critical utopian socialism and communism. Okay, this seems interesting. Okay. We do not here refer to the literature which in every great modern revolution has always given voice to the demands of the proletariat, such as the writings of, and I'm having trouble reading this word, 
or name Babeweuf, B-A-B-E-U-F, I don't know, uh, and others. <laughs> I'm going to move on, otherwise I'm going to be stuck on that single name for hours. The first direct attempts of the proletariat to attain its own ends made in times of universal excitement when feudal society was being overthrown. These attempts necessarily failed owing to the when, to the when, oh, sorry, to the then um, undeveloped state of the proletariat, as well as the absence of economic conditions for its emancipation, conditions that had yet to be produced and could be produced by the impending bourgeois epoch alone. The revolutionary literature that accompanied these first movements of the proletariat had necessarily a reactionary character. It inculcated universal ascetism and social leveling in its crudest form. The socialist and communist system properly so-called those of St. Simon Fourier Owen and others spring into existence in the early undeveloped period described above of the struggle between proletariat and bourgeoisie. The founders of these systems see indeed the class antagonism as well as the actions of the decomposing elements in the prevailing form of society. But, that the, pro but the proletariat as yet in its infancy offers to them the spectacle of a class without any historical in initiative or any independent political movement. Since the development of class antagonism keeps even pace with the development of industry, the economic situation as they find it does not as yet offer to them the material conditions for the emancipation of the proletariat. They therefore search after a new social science, after new social, after new social laws that are to create these conditions. Historical action is to yield to their personal in inventive, sorry, um, inventive action, historical created conditions of emancipation to fantastic ones, and the gradual spontaneous class organization of the proletariat to the organization of social special contrived by these inventors. Future history resolves itself in their eyes into the propaganda and the practical carrying out of their social plans. In the formation of their plans, they are conscious of caring chiefly for the interests of the working class, as being the most suffering class. Only from the point of view of being the most suffering class does the proletariat exist for, for them. The undeveloped, undeveloped state of the class struggle, as well as their own surroundings, causes socialists of this kind to consider themselves far superior to all class antagonism. They want to improve the conditions, the condition of every member of society, even that of the most favored. Hence, they habitually appeal to the society at large without discussion of class, nay, by preference to the ruling class. For how can people, when once they understand their system, fail to see it in the best possible plan of the best possible state of society? Hence, they reject all political and especially all revolutionary action. They wish to attain their ends by peaceful means and endeavor by a small experiments necessarily doomed to failure and by force of example to pave the way for the new social gospel. Such fantastic pictures of future society painted at a time when the proletariat is still in a very undeveloped state and was but a fantastic fantastic conception of its own position correspond with the first initiative yearnings of that class for a general construction of society, reconstruction of society, sorry. But these socialist and communist publications contain also a critical element. They attack every sim principle of existing society. Hence, they are full of the most valuable materials for the enlightenment of the working class. The practical measures proposed in them, such as the abolition of the distinction between town and country, of the family, of the carrying of industries for the, count, the, uh, for the account of private individuals, 
and of the wage system, the proclamation of social harmony, the conversion of the functions of the state into a mere superintendence of production, all these proposals point solely to the disappearance of class antagonism, which were at the time only, oh, skip another page, only just cropping up in which and which in these publications are recognized in their earliest indistinct and undefined forms only. These proposals, therefore, are of a purely utopian character, utopian character, sorry. The significance of critical utopian socialism and communism bears an inverse relation to the historical development. In proportion as the modern class struggle develops and takes definitive form, this, this fantastic standing apart from the contest, these fantastic attacks on it lose all practical value and, and all theoretical justification. Therefore, although the originators of these systems were in many respects revolutionary, their disciples have in every case formed mere reactionary sets. They hold fast by the original views of their masters in opposition to the progressive historical development of the proletariat. They therefore endeavor and that consistently to deaden the class struggle and to reconcile the class antagonism. They still dream of the experimental relation of their social utopias, of founding isolated Fallon stairs, which were socialist colonies in, uh, on the plan of Charles Fourier. Uh, Ikra was the name given by the Cabot of his utopia and later on to his American communist colony. Okay, never heard of it. Anyways, uh, founding isolated Fallon stairs of establishing home colonies, of setting up a little Icaria to decimal editions of the New Jerusalem and to realize all these castles in the air. They are compelled to appeal to the feelings and purposes of the bourgeois. By degrees, they sink into the category of the re reactionary conservative socialist depicted above. They're differing the, from these only by m more systematic pedantry and by their fanatical and superstitious beliefs in the miraculous effects of their social science. They therefore violently oppose all political actions, action on their part of the working class such as action, according to them, can only result from blind unbelief in the new gospel. The Aonites in England and the Fourierists in France respectively oppose the Chartists and the Reformists. Okay, and that was the end of chapter three. And now we have the two page long, or uh, yeah, sure, somewhat two page long, uh, chapter four, which is a position of the communist in the relation to the various existing opposition parties, parodies, what did I say like that? Parties. Section two has made clear the relations of the communists to the existing class, working class parties, such as the Chartists in England and the agrarian, agrarian reformists in America. The communists fight for the attainment of immediate aims for the enforcement of the monetary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of the movement. In France, the communists ally themselves with the social democrats. The party when then represented in a parliament by the by Le Drou Rollin, um, in literature by Louise Blanc, in the daily press by the reform, the name of social democracy signified with these its inventors a section of the Dem Democratic or Republican Party more or less tinged with socialism. I'd have to agree with that, yes. Um, sorry, so uh, in France, the communists ally themselves with the social democrats against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie, reverse, reserving, however, the rights to take up a critical position in regards to phrases and illusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolution. 
In Switzerland, they support the radicals without losing sight of the fact that this party consists of antagonistic elements, partly of democratic socialists in the French sense, partly of the radical bourgeois. In Poland, they support the party that insists on an agri agrarian revolution as the prime condition for national emancipation, that party, a party which for, for, sorry, uh, fomented the insurrection of Krako, I don't know what that is, I uh, never heard of it, but I'm going to search it up at some point, <laughs> of 1846. In Germany, they fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, the feudal uh, squirearchy, and the petty bourgeoisie. But they never cease for a single instant to in instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and a proletariat in order, in order that the German workers may straightway use as so many weapons against the bourgeoisie the social and political conditions that the bourgeoisie must necessarily introduce along with its supremacy and in order that after the fall of the reactionary classes in germany the fight against the bourgeoisie itself may immediately begin the communists turn their attention chiefly to germany because that uh, because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced con conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat than, uh, than that of England in the 17th and the France in the 18th century and because of the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be put the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. In all of these movements, they bring to the front as the leading question in which the property question, no matter what its degree of development at the time. Finally, they labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be obtained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at the communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. And that was it. That was the Communist Manifesto, and now it's for some reason followed by several blank pages, which I have literally no clue why they did that. Uh, no, no idea why they did that in this in this specific book. So that was 37 minutes, although it took me way longer to record it because for some reason today I just decided to not be able to read. Uh, I'm sorry if some of parts sound choppy or if they sound weird, it is because I had to record this in a lot of snippets like the first couple of recordings i recorded them in like almost an entire just in one go and i had to cut this uh this recording up into 63 different sections so i had to re-record a lot of parts um i don't know why but today maybe it's because i'm tired maybe it's because uh it's the weekend i don't know i'm just seemingly uh incapable of reading um therefore yes my comprehension of what i've read is not amazing however um, I do think that it was interesting to see the end, which is that, you know, kind of showing the uh, kind of the plan or kind of the the kind of goals of communism or, or of the communist parties and then kind of seeing it um, just kind of being played out in different ways. Obviously, there's a big like chapter three is more um, more focused on socialism, which, you know, communism is a form of socialism, but socialism is not per se communism. Um, so it is interesting to see them talk about socialism uh, and the different forms of socialism. And then, for example, so, uh, um, social uh, social democracies which uh to a lot of people and even to me are a bit of a a betrayal of socialism because social democracies are usually kind of a system that tries to um have like a hybrid or a mixed economy so they try to have a sections of like socialist uh 
forms of, of society, but they also want to have s certain forms of their society, or in this case, more of the economy, I mean, um, more connected to uh, capitalism, um, which to me feels like a bit of a betrayal of socialism because you're like, oh, we want to do socialism, but with, uh, with capitalism mixed in, uh, which is kind of just, yeah, it's a bit of a, a betrayal of what uh, socialism is. Um, and then we also have, yeah, they basically just talk about a bunch of different socialistic uh, uh, forms of uh, socialism. I don't know, that since didn't make much sense, but yeah, it was interesting to read that. And it's cool that I've now finished the Communist Manifesto. Uh, I'm not going to go too much more in depth into what I thought about the ending of the book, purely because I wanted to... I want to kind of reserve that to the next episode. So the next episode, I will not be reading anything. Uh, I will just be kind of doing a conclusion of the book. Um, and before I do that, I want to maybe reread some sections. I want to, uh, you know, do some research, kind of just get more in tuned to what the Communist Manifesto is and just get more informed so that I can do a more, um, not a more, a, a, a better, um, a better conclusion uh, than if I just now just started rambling a bit because I honestly don't know exactly what to say. And I think that trying to just make up some stuff uh, for the sake of it won't make it uh, into good content that is worth viewing. Um, so that being said, I think that's the end of the episode. So of course, don't forget to uh, support us over on Patreon. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to check out the blog. Don't forget to check out the Patreon, uh, the Patreon, uh, the Patreon, the, the podcast <laughs> it also starts with the letter P. Uh, so check out the podcast, check out the blog, um, check out our discord, um, check out our socials. As I said in the beginning of the episode to, you know, be always up to date to everything that's going on. Um, and yeah, uh, stay tuned to the next episode of this series where I'll be then doing the conclusion. Um, and then after that, I'll start a new book. Hopefully something that's a little easier to read because goddamn, the Communist Manifesto is not that easy to read, at least for me. And I have a hard time reading. So uh, yeah, that doesn't help much for me. But anyways, uh, yeah, that's it. See you all in the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.